This is the Six Figure Blueprint. It's a complete step-by-step -step process that has helped hundreds of thousands of sellers learn how to sell on Amazon, all the way from product research to product launch. It's the same process that we used to launch our latest product that now has over 800 reviews and has sold more than 10,000 units in just the first year. And well, you can see how much we made from that. Now, unlike us, you don't need to be an expert to get started. But because there is a lot we're gonna cover today, we do recommend pausing this video to take a few notes. And also, go ahead and bookmark this video, that way you can refer back to it again and again. We even helped you out by adding detailed chapters which you can find down in the description. Use those to help guide you back to the section you'd like to revisit. Okay, now let's jump right in, beginning with the very first thing that all new sellers need to do. The most important step to becoming an Amazon seller is understanding what types of products you should sell and which ones you should avoid. Not being able to find a good product is often the main reason why most people tell us they haven't started selling yet. It's a real problem and it can leave you in a state called analysis paralysis. So how do you finally push through and find a product that checks off all the boxes? The key is to look for products that meet most or ideally all six of these factors. When we launched our product last year, it met every single one of these except for low competition. Now, we're gonna come back to this in just a second, but first, it's very important to understand that the need to hit all six of these factors will depend on two things, your experience and your business model. First, your experience. If you're a complete beginner, I'd strongly recommend sticking with this list and making sure your product hits all six factors. Then on your second product, you come back and experiment with medium or maybe even high competition categories, just like we did. And secondly, the business model you choose will also determine how many of these six factors you should aim for. On Amazon, there's four main business models to consider. The first is called wholesale. This is when you buy products in bulk directly from larger known brands and then use the current Amazon listing to resell your inventory. The second one is called arbitrage. This can be done either in store or online and it's when you buy discounted products through retailers to then resell on Amazon. Drop shipping is the third business model. This is when you buy products directly from an online supplier and when a customer places an order, that supplier fulfills and ships the order on your behalf. The last one here is called private label. It's by far the best and most popular business model because unlike the other three, you're actually building a real brand that nobody can take away from you. And because you own 100% of it, you could one day even sell the entire business for thousands or even millions of dollars. This is why we chose this business model to launch our product and it's the one that we're showing you how to do in this video. The easiest way to explain private label is this. Put simply, it's when you take a generic product and place your own brand on it. Then by using a service called FBA or Fulfilled by Amazon, all you have to do is have your supplier ship your product to Amazon's warehouses and then they will take care of all the fulfillment for you. This means that you don't ever need to touch your own inventory, so you can literally run this entire business from home or really from anywhere in the world. Now, one question that we got asked in our last video was, can you sell in a country that you don't live in? The answer to that is yes. You do not need to have a physical address or even live in the country that you want to sell in. So if you live in the UK, you can sell in the US. And if you live in Pakistan, you can sell in the UK. You just need to read up on the country's tax laws that you plan on selling in and make sure that you follow all of their rules. Another important question is, how much money do you need to get started? So for private label, it's possible to get started with as low as $2,000, but if you have four to even $10,000, you'll obviously be in a much better position. In our case, our first round of inventory cost around $5,000, but keep in mind that our per unit product cost was around $11, which is somewhat high. So you can certainly find much cheaper products under $10, we then had a few other expenses that pushed our total startup cost to around $8,000. Now, later on in this video, we'll talk more about all of these costs, but honestly, we really didn't need to spend 
this much. We could have easily shaved off a few thousand dollars by simply doing our own photography, design, and not getting a trademark right away. Those are all nice to haves and definitely not mandatory to get started. So if you only have a few thousand dollars, then don't be discouraged because you really only need around half the amount that we started with. But if you still don't have that, then I'd highly recommend starting with one of the other three business models just to help you build up some initial cash flow. Now that we've set the table and you know what you're getting into, let me show you the best way to find profitable products on Amazon. To become a six-figure seller, you need to be willing to invest both time and resources to doing it right. The biggest mistake that a lot of beginners make is guessing which products to sell based on their own personal preference, or in other words, opinions and not hard facts. Your hard-earned money is at stake here, so it's important to make smart, data-driven decisions. This is how I found all of my products by using an Amazon specific tool like Jungle Scout. It removes the guesswork from product research and makes it easier by giving you access to every product's estimated sales, costs, profits, and much more. So starting right now, I'm gonna show you exactly how to find profitable products using my two favorite tools, Product Database and The Extension. With the Product Database, Every product on Amazon is loaded in here and we have these advanced filters to help us easily discover the best product ideas. So first up, select whichever marketplace that you want to sell in. In our case, we're selling in the US, but remember, no matter where you live in the world, you can sell in any of these marketplaces. Okay, so now let's bring back those six factors that make a good product. The first and most important is high demand. A high demand product is basically any product that a lot of shoppers are consistently buying on Amazon. This is the only factor on this list that you as a seller can't directly influence. It is possible to sell in a less competitive niche. It's even possible to lower your costs and become more profitable. But what's not possible is to create more demand that isn't already there. So to find high demand products, we can use the sales filter. And here I'd recommend looking for products that sell at least 300 units per month, which is about 10 sales per day. And that's a really good number to shoot for. Factor number two is low competition. On Amazon, look closely at the number of reviews your potential competition has. If the competition has a low amount of reviews, but still sells well, then that means it's gonna be easier for a new product like yours to come in and compete against them. The truth is because there's far more shoppers on Amazon than there are sellers, there are thousands of products out there with less than 100 reviews that are still getting over 300 monthly sales. So a really great way to start looking for these high demand, low competition products is to set the maximum number of reviews to 100. Factor number three is high profitability. You need to ensure that after all of your expenses that you're taking home a healthy profit in order to create a stable and growing business. A lot of people make the same mistake of selling products with low profitability and the minute Amazon increases their fees or maybe shipping costs go up, their product ends up failing because there's not enough profit to sustain the business. So we're gonna make sure that you don't make this common mistake. As a general rule of thumb, you wanna sell a product between 20 to $70 to allow for healthy profit margins. Below $20, the profit margins tend to get very slim and above $70, shoppers are less likely to make an impulse buy from a brand that they're not familiar with. So I would set those in the filters here. Now, factor number four is improvement potential. On Amazon, because new sellers are joining every single day, it's more important than ever to not just find a generic product and slap your logo on it, but instead find a product that you can slightly tweak to make it better. Making just one small improvement can really help increase your chances of standing out from the competition. So to determine improvement potential, you can utilize this star rating filter. This is the rating that every product on Amazon has on a scale of one to five. So for this, I'd suggest setting the maximum rating here to three, as that will help us find products that are selling well, despite having a poor rating. And surely if a product has a poor rating, there has to be room for improvement. 
And don't worry, once we set up all our filters, I'm gonna show you exactly what to look for when doing this. But now factor number five, which is ease to sell. Especially if this is your first product, it's best to sell something that isn't gonna give you too many headaches. Ideally, you'll find a simple product that's easy for a factory to make, isn't easily breakable, and is small and lightweight because Amazon actually will charge you more fees on products listed as oversized. So to avoid oversized products, you can come up here to the product tier section and select standard products only. An easy way to think about standard products is basically anything that can fit into a normal shoebox. And then next to that, I like to select FBA and FBM products only. That way we don't wanna waste our time looking at things that are sold by Amazon themselves. Now to help eliminate products that are either too hard to make or easily breakable, come over here and select all of the categories except for the ones that I left unchecked. I'm not saying that it's impossible to sell in these categories, but these are the categories that are typically cause more headaches for new sellers. So perhaps stay away from them if you're just beginning. On to factor number six, which is no legal or liability issues. There's no filter for this one, but it's one of the most important factors that you can't ignore. When searching for a product idea, don't consider selling anything that infringes on an existing patent or trademark, as well cross off any product that you can see potentially being sued for if something were to go wrong, like a child's car seat, for example. And hey, real quick, if you're getting any value from this video so far, let us know by hitting the like button down below. Okay, now to recap, all of these filters are set to help us discover only products that are high in demand, have low competition, are highly profitable, and can be improved, and are gonna be a lot easier to sell. Before coming over here and clicking search, the last thing you can do is to either include or exclude any keywords. So for example, you wouldn't really wanna sell anything related to COVID, so you could easily exclude keywords like mask and sanitizer. But now that you know what makes a good product, you can come over, click search, and this is where we get into the fun part, analyzing product ideas. As we look at our search results here, keep in mind that you don't always need to utilize all of these filters at once. In, in fact, I'd encourage you to play around and see what different results you get by changing up the filters. You can even come up here and load some different presets that we've created for you, or even save the ones that you've created and can come back to later. So the process from here is just to scroll through this list now and pick out some potential ideas. And as soon as you find something interesting, the next step is to begin analyzing the product niche, or in other words, we already know that all of these products meet our six factors of a good product, but we don't yet know if they meet the six factors of a good product niche. So we're going to analyze the entire market now for one of these products. And to do that, go ahead and take your product. You can easily do this by clicking this icon here, which will bring you right to the products listing. Once here, Find what you think are the best keywords that accurately describe this product. And now we're gonna put this into the search bar. But if those keywords aren't obvious right away from the, the title or even the bullet points, then no worries. Just use the Jungle Scout extension to look up the product's main keywords. To do that, simply click this icon and you'll be directed to Jungle Scout's keyword research tool. You'll typically find that the main keyword is somewhere up at the top, all the way up here. And if you click the icon next to it, it will send you to a search results page for that keyword back on Amazon. Now, I just mentioned the extension and we're actually gonna be using it again to help us analyze this product's niche. So to do that, open up the extension to see real-time sales data for all the products listed on the page. You're able to see things like the monthly and daily sales, revenue, estimated net profit, and other helpful data, including averages for all the products on page one. What we're looking for now are the demand levels of this category as a whole. So specifically, we're just gonna focus on the top 10 listings here 
on page one. The reason why we focus on the first 10 listings is because the majority of customers generally don't go much further down the page when they're looking for a product. That's why we want to ensure that there's not too much competition that prevents us from getting into these top spots. However, we also want to make sure that there's enough demand across these top spots so that even if we take just a tiny share of those sales, we can still make good money. So when it comes down to demand, you want to see the top 10 products have a total of around 3,000 monthly sales, which averages out to 300 sales per listing. Once you've confirmed that, you then wanna make sure that the sales are reasonably distributed amongst the top 10 listings. So if one or two listings are getting the majority of sales, then it may be best to pass on this product idea because customers are clearly only buying from the top listings. So even if your product were to rank in the top 10 up here, it's gonna be an uphill battle trying to convince shoppers to buy your product over the competitions. Now let's look at the competition. And again, for that, let's look at the number of reviews or what Amazon now calls ratings. For this, you wanna make sure that the top 10 products here have an average of say no more than a thousand reviews, but ideally at least three to five of them have less than say a hundred reviews. Now let's talk about profitability. Remember, we wanna price our product between 20 and $70. So let's check the average price up here at the top, which will show you average price of all of the products on this page. Next, pick a product and click the net column. This will pop open an extremely helpful tool called the FBA Profit Calculator. This is where you can really start calculating your potential profit by entering in your estimated per unit product cost. So how exactly do you find out what your per unit cost might be? Well, for now, because we're just trying to confirm whether or not uh, we should go any further with this idea, you can search your product idea over on a site called Alibaba just to get a general idea of what suppliers are charging. And don't worry, in the supplier section of this video, we're gonna dive much deeper into this, but just for now, let's pull up a few different listings and find what the average price seems to be. Then. We're gonna grab these and come back to the profit calculator and enter that into the product cost section. Now to further help you determine the profitability, you need to consider the two main costs that will affect your profit margin. These are your landed costs and your Amazon fees. Landed costs are mostly made up of the cost to make your product, which is what we just entered into the profit calculator, but you also need to consider the cost to have it shipped into Amazon. You may also want to include other costs such as any prep or inspection fees, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later on. And then also consider any customs duties, which will vary based on where you're ordering from and where you're shipping to. But for the most part, the bulk of your landed cost is going to be the product cost and the shipping cost. So here we're going to take our product cost and we're going to add on an estimate of say $3 to allow some room for the shipping cost and have a more accurate landed cost. Now, the other cost that I mentioned is Amazon fees. There are a few different fees that you should know about. First is the referral fee, which is what Amazon charges for bringing customers to your listing and selling it. This is usually up to about 15% of your selling price, which is actually a really great deal considering how much Amazon is doing. Secondly, if you're using FBA, you have a fulfillment fee that does vary depending on the weight and dimensions of your product and what country you're selling in. Other additional fees that you may need to consider are long-term storage fees, which you get charged only if you have inventory that stays unsold in Amazon's warehouses for more than a year. So you don't need to worry about that at this stage. You've also got your monthly seller central fee for using Amazon, which on a professional subscription is about $40 per month. We'll talk more about setting up your account a bit later in this video. But now with both your landed costs and your Amazon fees in mind, the best way to gauge profitability is to calculate your ROI, which stands for return on investment. The goal here is to get at least 100% ROI, 
which basically means that for every dollar you spend, you get $2 back. Here's an important tip to remember. For every product that you're evaluating, think, can I source and ship this to Amazon for substantially less than it's selling for? To help you calculate that, consider the rule of thirds. One third goes towards Amazon fees, one third goes towards your landed cost, and then one third goes to you. To help simplify this process, I recommend coming back to the profit calculator to find out exactly what Amazon's fees would be for certain products. So back to this example, let's say that I was looking to sell this product for $21. Amazon's total fee is about $7, which is a third of the selling price. Considering the rule of thirds, I should be aiming to have my landed costs for this product be under $7, which again includes the cost to source and ship the product into Amazon. Doing that would give me a profit of seven or so dollars, which again is roughly a third and gets me my 100% ROI. Now, if the product would have cost much more than this, then that's when I'd move on to another product as the profit margin on this one would be starting to get a little low. But if everything checks out and you're above 100% ROI, then you can X out of the calculator here and then go through and click the plus icon for at least these top 10 products. What that will do is add them to the Jungle Scout product tracker, which is a tool designed to help you easily compare and keep track of all of your product ideas. Now, we just did that for only one product idea. So what you wanna do now is to keep repeating this process until you have at least 10 different product ideas. Do keep in mind, however, that this process can take time. You might vet a lot of different ideas and go down a lot of rabbit holes and most of them might come to nothing. This is, however, the process and it's the most important stage of the business. Your product is the foundation of your entire business, so it's well worth spending this extra time to find a really great product, even if that might take a few weeks. Once you've got your list of five to 10 product ideas, you're almost at the point now where you can start comparing all your product ideas and narrowing it down to the one that you're going to sell. But you can't do that without first reaching out to suppliers. So far, we've only estimated our product costs and we won't know for sure what it actually costs until we get real quotes from real suppliers. So make sure you pay close attention to this next section to learn how to find, contact and work with suppliers. Step two, reach out to suppliers. Two years ago, I made one of the biggest mistakes I've ever made, and that was quitting this process just because I couldn't figure out this whole supplier thing. How do I find suppliers? What do I say in my emails? And what do all these shipping terms mean? I never really found clear answers to those questions, so I just gave up. But now that I know what I didn't know then, I realized I only gave up because I didn't follow this step-by-step -step framework that guided me through the entire process. And so that's what I'm gonna do for you right now. So feel free to take some notes if you need to, and let's get right into this four-step process. Step one is to create a list of five to 10 suppliers per product idea. The outcome you're trying to achieve with this step is to identify high quality and experienced suppliers. So how do you find these suppliers? Well, there are two main ways. The first way is by using Alibaba.com, the same site we briefly used earlier to grab rough estimates of our product cost. And the second way is to use Jungle Scout's supplier database, an awesome tool that helps you not just find, but also verify the legitimacy of suppliers. So you can first start by heading over to Alibaba and searching for your product idea. But before even looking at the list, check these two boxes to help filter out the suppliers who aren't verified or offer trade assurance. Trade Assurance is a program that helps ensure that your product is produced to the quality you expect, is paid for securely, and is shipped on time. If there's any issues at all, Alibaba will actually help you file a dispute and get reimbursed. And while you're here, it's also smart to come down to this section and select the country you plan on selling in. This is really helpful because you don't wanna work with a supplier that has zero experience shipping products to the country you're selling in. And if you're selling in Europe or North America, some of these other countries actually operate under different quality standards. This is all about setting yourself up for success. So once you've done this, you can now start scanning through this list. 
And when doing so, I'd highly recommend only looking for suppliers who've been selling for at least a few years. You can find this information right under the prices or by clicking into the listing in reviewing this section here. But I just need to warn you real quick, sometimes this information can be very misleading. So to verify the accuracy, head over to the supplier database and type in the name of the supplier. Here, you can see their full shipment history to confirm the date of their first shipment. So how does Jungle Scout know this? Well, it's all done by collecting free information on all the shipments that are imported into the United States and the suppliers who are doing them. With this, you can see exactly how many shipments a supplier has sent into the United States, which gives you a really great idea of their size and authenticity, especially if they've done a lot of shipments. But if a supplier hasn't got much on record, then they may not be as credible or as experienced as you may have thought. So for example, you can see this supplier here has only started sending products to the US within the past eight years. But if we head back over to Alibaba, you can see how this is much different than the years they have listed as being in business. Coming back to the database, you can also find suppliers with this tool in ways that are honestly much more beginner friendly. So you can actually just type in the name of the company that's already selling this product on Amazon, which is a really great way of finding out which suppliers your competitors are using. And even if you don't know their full legal business name, you can just go to their Amazon listing and copy their ASIN, then come back and paste it here to find their exact supplier. Now, personally, this is my favorite way of finding suppliers because if your competitor's product is getting a ton of great reviews on Amazon, then you can pretty much assume that their supplier makes a high quality product. And lastly, just like Alibaba, you can always search for suppliers by typing in the product name itself. Now, step two is to start sending out those initial contact emails. The outcome you're trying to achieve here is to send a detailed list of questions to all the suppliers you found. And to do this, you'll first need to track down each supplier's contact information using either Alibaba or the supplier database. On Alibaba, it's pretty straightforward. You simply just click this contact supplier button. But just a fair warning here, Alibaba's messaging system can get a little bit messy, so you may just wanna try out the supplier database instead. Here, you can click this button to run a search for the supplier on Google. And oftentimes you'll find that the good suppliers will have a website where you can find their email addresses and contact them that way which in my opinion is a much cleaner way of keeping track of all of your messages. Okay, now understandably, this is where most people get stuck. And honestly, it's exactly where I got stuck two years ago. What are you supposed to say in the initial contact email? Well, to help you out, here's the template we use to send out to all of our suppliers. First, introduce yourself. Then briefly let them know what you're looking for. If your product already exists on Amazon, include a link to an identical product just to make sure they fully understand your intention. And if you're looking to customize your product, as we strongly recommend doing, include a picture with any potential modifications clearly marked. A great tool that you can use for this is called TechSmith Capture, and it's actually free to download. Next, let them know where you plan on selling and how many units you estimate purchase after a sample and a small trial order. But honestly, you don't have to get this right. You're just trying to let them know that you're serious about doing business with them. And then under that, lay out all of your product requirements and specifications. And just keep in mind here, you wanna make this as easy as possible for the person reading, so that's why I'd recommend sticking to bullet points. Now for your list of questions, first, it's important to ask if they're a manufacturer or a trading company. So the difference here is that a trading company is more of a middleman that purchases products from a variety of suppliers and then resells them. Generally, you'd rather work directly with a manufacturer because not only will you get the best prices, but you'll also be able to customize the product or at least easily modify it. It's a lot harder to do that with a trading company because again, they're more of a middleman. However, the advantage of a trading company is that you can often get much smaller minimum order quantities. So there are some positive trade-offs as well. Now a manufacturer on the other hand, may require you to purchase a minimum of 500 to 1000 pieces. On Alibaba, you'll typically see on the company profile page, whether they are a manufacturer or a trading company. But another great way to check is to see what types of products they're selling. If you see lots of different products that are typically made using different materials or even different machinery, then they're probably a trading company. Back to the template, ask the supplier for their best per unit price if you were to place an order for say 500 units, except you wanna ask for three separate quotes here and these are very important. These are called INCO terms. It's really, really important to know what these mean, so I'm going to help explain these in the simplest way I can. Let's start with FOB. 
This is by far the most popular one, and it's actually the same one we use for our products. So this is when the supplier is responsible for loading your goods onto the ship at an agreed upon port. From there, this is when you take over the responsibility for both paying and arranging for the rest of the shipment to go from the destination port to Amazon's warehouses. This next inco term is called EXW. This is when the supplier is not responsible for getting your goods to the port. Instead, you and your freight forwarder are responsible for both paying and arranging the shipment to get it from the warehouse all the way into Amazon. So EXW will typically be cheaper, but FOB is by far more common. But in both cases, you'll want to work with what's called a freight forwarder, who is someone that will take the headache out of handling all the logistics for you, especially if you choose EXW. And don't worry, we have a full section later on in this video that shows you exactly how to find and hire these freight forwarders. Now this last inco term here is called DDP. It's not the most common because honestly, a lot of suppliers just don't offer it, but essentially it's when the supplier is 100% responsible for all the cost and getting your goods from their warehouse all the way into Amazon. Now, of course they do charge you for this. So if a supplier does offer you a DDP quote, it's important to check to make sure that they aren't overcharging you. Again, later on in this video, we'll show you exactly how to compare all of your shipping options. Now that you know all your inco terms, make sure to ask how much a sample will cost and what the lead time is to receive one. All lead time means is how long it takes to make the product after you've placed the order. Next, ask what their payment terms are, what type of packaging they offer, and whether or not their price includes customizing the packaging. And then ask if there are any additional charges for adding your logo to the product itself. Lastly, see if they have another preferred method of communication. You may find that they can respond much faster through an app like WhatsApp. And then just a quick note here, make sure you send this exact same email out to your entire list of suppliers so that you can judge the responses equally. Now with a link down in the description, you can get access to this template inside our written guide for how to sell on Amazon. It includes step-by-step -step tutorials, expert tips, free tools, templates, and much more all for free. So make sure to grab your own copy with the link below. Okay, on to step three. This is where you begin vetting your supplier's responses. The outcome you're trying to achieve here is to just narrow down your list to the top three. As your responses start coming in, you can keep track of all of your notes inside the Jungle Scout Supplier Tracker. This is an incredibly helpful way to begin narrowing down your top three suppliers, as this tool allows you to input quotes, sample cost, shipping cost, and any other details you receive from suppliers. You can even take notes throughout the entire process, including how easy communication was. Where this note section really comes in handy is to keep score of your favorite suppliers. Step four, this is when you order and evaluate your samples. But first, just a few notes regarding this. It's going to be typical to pay anywhere from 50 to $150 just for a single sample. And the best way to pay is usually with a wire transfer. Although you can never go wrong with good old PayPal. The other payment method just to be familiar with is using trade assurance through the Alibaba platform. I mentioned this earlier, this is a great option because it provides you a lot more protection for your payments that you can set. In this case, paying through a wire transfer is actually the main option you'd most likely use. And this is also the same method you're going to use to place your first order on Alibaba. Now, when you finally receive samples, make sure you take the time to really compare them. What's the quality of the sample like? Use it in a way that a customer would and see how it holds up. Also, how quickly did it arrive? Was the communication easy? Based on all that information and more, for each product idea you ordered a sample for, it's now time to narrow it down to your top supplier for each one. And one thing I note here is that a supplier will rarely be perfect in every single area. Usually you just have to weigh up the pros and cons and go with the one that ticks the most boxes. When you've done that, the next step is to combine all of your notes to determine which product makes the most sense for you to sell. And this is the fun part. So stick with me now as we move on to step three, choosing your product. When we launched this product last year, do you think we had any idea just how successful it would actually be? You bet we did. Because we chose our product based on data, we knew for certain that it had high demand, high profitability, we knew we could improve the product, it was simple to make and easy to sell, and it had zero legal or liability issues that could shut us down later. But whatever happened to selling products with low competition? Well, when we were in the process of deciding which product to sell, initially, yes, we were very concerned about the competition just because it was really high. But also, because the demand for this product was also very high, we dove back into the data and found a way to niche down. 
So what I mean by that is we found a little hidden niche within the category that turned this product from a high to a relatively low or even medium competition. I'm gonna show you exactly how we did that and hopefully by seeing how we chose our product over all the other ones we were considering at the time, you'll get a better understanding of how to do it for your products. All of our analysis took place right here in the Jungle Scout Product Tracker, a tool that lets you easily organize, group, and compare all your product ideas to help you confidently pick your next product. It's also great for keeping an eye on your closest competitors. Now, of course, you can also do this in Excel. However, the main benefit of this tool is that once you add products in, it automatically will track and update with real-time sales, saving you the time having to come back and re-enter all this data again manually. And it even lets you go back to the previous six months and view the trends over time. Now, this is really important because before you go investing a ton of money, you wanna have a better idea of how many units these products typically sell per day. This then becomes how much you could expect to make if your product were to eventually rank in the top 10 of search results. So this is what you should look for. It all starts with demand. With all your ideas next to each other, focus your attention on the average daily sales and revenue columns. These will help you compare which products have the highest level of demand. When looking at this list, we knew that the washable pee pads didn't have the highest sales, but they were still well above our target of 10 daily sales. For the competition levels, take note of this reviews column. This will be the main metric that tells you how hard it would be to compete with the current sellers in this category. For the pee pads, you can see it's just way too competitive. And we actually almost got rid of it before realizing that when we initially researched the product idea, we noticed there were a ton of different variations out there. There were small, medium, and large pee pads, and then there were one, two, and three packs being sold. This means we could possibly sift through all the data again and find a combination of these two variables that are much easier to compete with. And by just adding every single product on pages one to five to our product tracker, we recorded how many products were in each variable. This is what we learned. Most people were selling small and large pee pads, but the medium sized ones still had really high demand. So when we narrowed down our search to just the medium sizes, we noticed most of the products were being sold in a one or a two pack. So that means there was a gap in the market for a medium sized three pack variation. By removing all the products in our group that weren't medium sized, this lowered our competition levels and made this idea much more realistic. This niching down strategy also helped us better calculate the true profitability, which is the next factor you need to consider. To start comparing profitability, there are a few things you need to look at. First and foremost is the average price column. Remember, it's a much safer bet to sell products in the range of $20 to $70. That way, when you're hit with these ever-increasing Amazon fees, you're still able to achieve a healthy net profit. But remember, if you followed the steps in the previous section and contacted suppliers, you should have gotten real quotes that you can now use to better calculate your expected profit. For each product idea, just plug those real quotes into the calculator and then just make sure to add a few extra dollars to account for other costs like shipping and taxes. What I'd strongly recommend doing now is to run a few more calculations just to find your break even point. This is the price you can sell at and still be profitable with your product cost. You basically wanna find out what is the worst case scenario. So for this, slightly increase your product cost again and then decrease your product price until you find the point where you hit $0 in profit. You wanna do this because there's a really good chance that the product cost you're estimating right now is actually lower than what it will be when you go to place your first round of inventory. Plus, when you first launch on Amazon, it's best to start with a much lower price anyways just to help you get those first initial sales. So make sure you run a few tests to find your break even price and understand what the worst case scenario may look like. Just make sure to do this for every product you're considering, record all of your findings, and hit the like button if you're enjoying this video. Let's now talk about improvement potential, which is arguably one of the most important factors to consider. I actually already showed you one of the ways to improve any product, and that's by increasing the pack size. In our case, by offering a three pack instead of the usual one or even two pack, we're able to offer a better price per pad than most of our competitors. But improving the cost value is just one way of doing this, and another way is to actually improve the quality or functionality. To find out how to do that, pull up your competitor's listings and read through all of their one, two, and three star reviews. You should start to see some trends and discover what people are actually saying they don't like about the product. This could be anything from the color, material, size, usability, functionality, or really anything else. Then, just like we did, take these problems and tell your supplier to fix them so that you can bring an improved product to the market. 
Another simple way to improve any product is to just bundle it with something else. So if you take a look at any listing, you'll typically see this frequently bought with a section. And if you keep seeing the same items being bought over and over again on multiple products in your category, then it could be a great idea to bundle them together. This means that you're offering additional value to customers who only need to buy your product to get the two things they ultimately want. Plus it helps you stand out from the competition and oftentimes it's more profitable because now you can sell two items at a much higher price. The next factor is ease to sell. Remember, you don't wanna sell anything that's going to give you too many headaches, and with physical products, one of the biggest headaches by far is high shipping cost. So try to find a product that is relatively lightweight and is standard size, not oversized. Again, these are products that can usually fit within a shoebox, and because of that, are much cheaper to make as well as ship. On Amazon, simple is better. So ask yourself, is it breakable? Is it likely to be returned? Is it hard to use? How long will it last? Do you think it'll get a lot of negative reviews? Keep all these questions in mind, and trust me, the more product research you do, the more these questions will just naturally become part of your initial thought process. Now, the last factor to consider is legal and liability issues. But first up, just a disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. But we do get these questions all the time, so let's address them. The most important question to ask yourself is, are there any existing patents on this product? If so, you can't sell it, because that means someone else owns the rights to either the design or the way something even functions. In fact, when we were first looking at selling these dog bowls up here, we eventually found out that there was a patent on the version we were looking at, so that's the reason why we eliminated it from our list. So how do you know if there's a patent? Well, the only way to know for sure is to hire a lawyer, but just some quick and scrappy steps that you can take on your own include doing a Google search for your product, plus patent. You can also check listings on Amazon and see if they mention anything regarding a patent. Oftentimes, if a product has a patent, you'll even see it on the packaging. Or you can check if there are other sellers selling the exact same product. If so, this is usually a good sign as patent holders typically enforce their patent, stopping others from selling the same thing. But again, these are just some quick things that you can do that don't guarantee there isn't a patent. So if you found something and you're not sure it has a patent, the best thing you can do is just hire a lawyer. Now, the next thing to consider here is potential liabilities. So, could someone easily get hurt using your product? An example of this might be things that go in or on people's bodies, anything that's flammable, really hazardous, and so on. Next, consider trademarks. You can search the trademark database on USPTO or even a site like Trademarkia to see whether a trademark exists for the product you're looking at. You also need to consider whether Amazon has any restrictions on selling that type of product. Here's a list of some of the prohibited items that you can't sell on Amazon. And just a quick pro tip here, if you're ever unsure whether or not you can sell something, once you have your Seller Central account, which don't worry, we'll show you how to do later on, uh, once you're in there, you can actually just type in the name of your product and it will then tell you whether or not Amazon has any restrictions around selling that item. With all six of these factors in mind, it's now time to make a decision and choose the product that makes the most sense. And to help you with this, here's my best piece of advice. Rarely will you ever find a product that just absolutely crushes it in all six of these factors. But if anything, your product must have high demand and high profitability. Whatever you do, do not budge on these two. Your idea can have high competition, no way to improve the product, or even just be a little bit on the harder end to sell. But the two things it absolutely can't have is low demand and low profitability. These are two of the biggest reasons why I see most sellers fail. They either can't sell enough because the demand just isn't there, or if they are selling, they actually end up losing money or just not making enough of it to survive. So give yourself a fighting chance and pick a product that you know at least hits these two factors. Once you feel confident that you found that product, your next step is to create a brand and set up your business. You'll need to know how to choose a brand name, how to properly structure your business legally, and how to sign up for your Amazon Seller Central account. These are all things you'll learn in this next section, so make sure to stick around to learn everything you need to know before getting started. Step four, set up your business and seller central account. The best businesses never just sell products, they sell a brand. So what's gonna be the name of your brand? On Amazon, I'd recommend choosing a brand name that's both simple and generic. That way you're not locking yourself into a specific range of products. 
Now, the only exception to this is if you're just dead set on building a business around one particular market, which in that case, you can just go with something more specific like Jake's dog products. But if you're going into this trying to find the best products to sell regardless of the category, then I'd highly recommend choosing a broader brand name. That way you can sell a variety of products underneath it, just like we've done with our brand, Jungle Creations. When it comes to setting up your business, you'll most likely begin by creating a separate legal entity. The most common one is called an LLC. Now this isn't a requirement, but there are three main advantages to having one. First, it's not particularly expensive and it doesn't affect your taxes too much, which is great. Second, an LLC creates separation between yourself and your business. This will help shield you from any potential liabilities and if you were to ever get sued, it will also protect your personal assets. And the third benefit is that you'll be able to set up a separate business bank account and credit card, which means you'll be eligible for some pretty cool cashback rewards that only business cards can offer. So if you're on the fence whether or not to sign up for an LLC, you should keep in mind that some freight forwarders will actually require you to have one in order to work with them. And as far as the name for your LLC goes, this doesn't really matter much because it won't ever be displayed on Amazon to your customers. Your brand name will always be separate from your business name. And as far as how to set up your LLC, this is really up to you, but personally, I found it super easy using LegalZoom because they do most of the work for you and then lay out all the steps that you need to take. The next important part of setting up your business is to register for your Amazon Seller Central account. This is the headquarters for running your entire business on Amazon. So follow along as I take you through a step-by-step -step walkthrough of setting up your account. And I will be showing you this process for sellers in the United States marketplace, although just keep in mind, this process is very similar for all the other countries. So first, to sign up for your account, go to services.amazon.com. Here, you'll get to choose what marketplace you want to sell in. And it's good to know that you don't actually need to have a physical address or even live in the country you want to sell in. So if you live in the UK, you can sell in the US. And if you live in Pakistan, you can sell in the UK. You just need to read up on that country's tax laws that you plan on selling in, and then just make sure to follow all their rules. Next, you have two options. An individual account is free, although Amazon will charge you 99 cents per sale. Also, keep in mind that you won't be eligible to sell in all of the available categories, and you won't have access to certain features like advertising. So if you're serious about starting this business, I'd strongly recommend going with the professional account. Now, this one does cost $40 a month, but you are free to sell in any category and access all the features to help you sell more. But if you're on a tight budget, I totally understand. I would just recommend starting with an individual account first, and then you can always transition to a professional account at any time. So feel free to do that and then just switch over once you're in the process of having your product manufactured. And just a real quick virtual high five if you've gotten this far, because now things are getting real and you're this close to becoming a seller. So keep it going. Now let's move on to the rest of this registration process. Next, either sign in with your existing Amazon account or create a brand new one. I'd highly recommend setting up a new account for this just to help keep your personal shopping separate from your business, but really most importantly, separating your accounts will make it much easier to file your taxes. Trust me on that. After that, Amazon will email you a verification code to confirm your new account. Then in the account setup, you'll first start by entering your country or business location. Next up is your business type. You can sign up as an individual or as a business if you already have one set up. So if you do have a US LLC single member, then you can just select individual instead of business as it's actually treated very similarly. Or if you're selling as an individual, you'll simply just type in your name then select Agree and Continue. Now for individuals, you'll need to enter information about your country of citizenship, country of birth, and date of birth. Or if you're a business, then you'll need to enter your company registration number, which is usually your EIN. Following that, enter your business address regardless of whether you're an individual or a business. And just a quick note on this, customers can see this. So if you're not comfortable with putting your real address out there, you can always get a PO address and just use that one instead. But just keep in mind, you do need to be able to receive mail at this address because Amazon will most likely send you a postcard for verification. At this point, you need to enter your phone number so Amazon can send you a verification code. Once you've verified that, click next. Now you need to enter your credit card to charge your subscription to. So if you have an LLC, I strongly recommend signing up for a business credit card. That way you can benefit from the cash back rewards. And if you're selling from outside of the US, you can always get a card by using a service such as Payoneer or even Wise. The next step is to create a store name. This can be whatever you want. It is going to be separate from your brand name and it's not really that important. Plus you can always just change it in the future. 
Next, do you have UPCs for all your products? I would say yes here because you will need these for any products that you list. And, and don't worry, we are gonna talk more about UPCs in this next section, but for now you can just click yes. Now, are you the manufacturer or brand owner? In this case, also select yes, because if you're doing private label, that means you are the brand owner as well as the manufacturer. If you already have a trademark for your brand, then you could say yes here as well, as this is the beginning of the brand registry process. But if you're just starting out, you likely won't have this yet, and you can just click no. Um, but you can always come back and apply for brand registry at a later point. On this final screen, double check that your information is correct, and then upload any necessary documents that Amazon is asking for. This might change depending on what country or information you entered in earlier, but usually it's just a bank statement or even a copy of your ID. Then click submit and your account will be reviewed by Amazon and hopefully set up soon. And that's really it. You now have access to Seller Central. But just a quick note here, uh, we've heard a lot that Amazon is a little bit fussy when it comes to verifying accounts. So if you don't get verified right away the first time, no worries, uh, they'll typically just email you what went wrong so that you know how to fix it. But once you're all signed up, in your account, you can find your FN SKU barcode. Now this is super important to know before you get your product made, uh, since all Amazon products require this barcode on the packaging. So this next section will show you exactly how to locate this in your account, along with all the the other packaging requirements you need to know about. So before we go much further, this is when you need to know about what barcodes you need and how to properly package your product. So for starters, in order to even create a listing inside your Amazon account, you're required to have a UPC barcode. This is the barcode that you essentially see on all packaging. The best place to find and purchase these barcodes is directly through GS1, which is the agency that manages this. They can also be technically purchased from third-party sellers at a cheaper rate. However, this is against Amazon's terms of service, so I'd highly advise instead only using GS1 barcodes. Amazon requires you to have one UPC barcode per product or per product variation that you're selling. To purchase your barcodes, Head over to gs1.org. On the right hand side, click on get your barcodes, select your country, then click get a barcode. Next, scroll down and consider your two options. The first option is if you're starting small and only need a few barcodes. Each one is gonna cost you $30 and you can buy as many as you'd like. Now, the second option is gonna be better if you need more than just a few barcodes. As a general rule of thumb, if you need less than eight, stick with the first option. But if you're needing more than eight barcodes or anticipate needing more than eight in the future, then go with the second option for the best overall savings. So let's say that you just need one barcode. Go ahead and click this button to begin adding it to your cart. From here, enter your brand name, which is the name that you wanna share with your customers. And usually this is different than your registered business name. So for example, let's say that my business name is Lenny's Products LLC, and my brand name is perhaps Lenny's Pet Supplies. Because the latter is the name that I want my customers to see, that's the brand name that I'm gonna enter in here. For the product description, this is the description that you share with retailers, not the marketing description that you share with shoppers. So you want to include these four pieces of information, your brand name, type of product, product variation, and net contents. For example, Lenny's Pet Supplies Dog Pad Large 3-Pack. Then click Add to Cart and Continue as New. This will bring you to a general checkout page and once you fill out all of the information, click confirm order. Next, you're gonna receive an email to create a password and sign in. After signing in, click access GS1 data hub, click product, and then it opens up. Now at the bottom, you're gonna see your GTIN 12, also known as your UPC barcode. A quick note here, if you purchase the barcodes in bulk, you're gonna to need to click product and then create. Enter a description and brand name, like we mentioned earlier, and then click save. Once the GTIN button is activated, click auto assign GTIN. At the bottom, you'll see your GTIN 12 or UPC barcode. 
After you've purchased and assigned your UPC barcode, you can now create your product's packaging. This is a very important step as you need to meet certain requirements. So let me walk you through the two main requirements your packaging must have. The first one is the country of origin. This is wherever your product was manufactured. The second requirement is an FNSKU barcode. This is the code that Amazon requires for all products being sent into their warehouses. You'll get this code in Seller Central after purchasing your UPC barcode and creating your first listing. We're gonna show you later on in this video how to create your listing, but really quick, here's how you can locate your FNSKU barcode. Once your listing is created, go to Manage Inventory. Now next to your listing, you wanna click on this little drop down here. Now you can click here to view your FNSKU barcode. That's gonna bring up this PDF, save that one to your computer, and now you have the barcode which you can send on to your supplier so that they can print it directly onto your product packaging. People often get confused between this FN SKU barcode and the UPC barcode and which one they need to print on their packaging. So to clarify, you only need the UPC barcode in order to create your listing. Once you've created your listing, you then only need your FN SKU barcode on the product packaging itself. You no longer need the UPC barcode at this point. I really hope that clears things up for you. And if it did, we'd really appreciate it if you hit the like button down below. Okay, let's move on to designing and determining your packaging style. A good place to start here is by asking your factory what they typically do for this type of product. From here, you can decide if this is what you want to do or if you want to improve upon the basic packaging style. This decision will be based on what you think your customer expects for your type of product. So for instance, if it's a gift item, you might wanna offer fancier packaging. But on the flip side, if it's just a disposable item, customers may not care how it's packaged. So your packaging could be anything from just a fancy bag to a plain cardboard box. You may also decide if you want your packaging to include a few extra things that are nice to have, but are not mandatory. Perhaps you want to include something visually appealing, such as a business card or a product insert that includes your contact information. You can use these to ask customers for their email addresses, to leave a review, cross sell other products in your catalog and so on. If you do decide to include these, it's very important to remember that you're not allowed to ask for only happy customers to write reviews. Now, if you're wanting to design and create your own packaging, some good options here include using a tool like Canva to sketch up design ideas, or you can even hire someone for cheap on sites like Fiverr or Upwork to design it for you. You'll then need to send the designs to your supplier in what's known as a vector format. Ordering your first round of inventory can be scary. I remember back when I placed my first order, I think it was around $2,000, $3,000 at the time. It was terrifying. I had to send this huge amount of money to someone in China. Uh, I wasn't sure if it was a scam, but it all was fine in the end. That being said, even today, when I launch new products, there's still a little bit of fear around placing that initial order. So if you do experience that, it's a totally normal feeling, but as long as you've taken the steps that we outlined earlier to verify the product opportunity, then you're gonna be set up with the best chance of succeeding. So to begin, let me give you some advice when it comes to negotiating a price with your supplier. However, keep in mind that this process will often take place before you decide on your final supplier. So you will usually have your final prices when you make that decision earlier. So now on to tip number one. It's best if you have more than one supplier that you're willing to work with, that way you can push harder on the price without worrying about losing them. Usually this is gonna come from the top three suppliers list that you created earlier. Tip number two, figure out what is the maximum price that you'd be willing to pay and be willing to walk away if you're not satisfied with the price that they give you. And tip number three, ask how many units you would need to order in order to get the lowest price possible. If you can't get the price that you want right now, but you know that you can get that price later on in the future when you place larger orders, then you should be okay with a slightly higher price to begin with. Once you've settled on a price, the next step is to create a purchase order and send it to your supplier. 
To make this easier for you, we actually have a sample purchase order agreement and template that you can fill out to generate your order. You can find this in Jungle Scout in the supplier tracker by clicking the purchase orders tab where you can begin creating the order. Now, while you may not be able to legally enforce this, it is a great way to make very clear to the supplier what you're ordering. The typical payment terms that you can expect are either 30% upfront and then 70% once your order ships. Another common payment term that some suppliers use is 50% upfront and then the other 50% after your order ships. Now, especially when placing your first order with a new supplier, one thing you might want to do is to run an inspection. This will help ensure the quality of your product and protect you from receiving unsellable inventory. Now, while a lot of people choose to do an inspection, this is technically an optional step. You do just have to balance the sort of risk versus reward. But in my personal opinion, I do think it's worth it to do it anyway. How it works is that you pay a third party company. Two popular ones are Kima and Vtrust. And then they're gonna send out a representative to your supplier. They can check for specific things that you ask them to look for but they'll also have their own list of standard checks that they're gonna go through. Now, even if you've got a great sample from your supplier, you still wanna ensure that your first order lives up to that same standard. And while inspections are relatively cheap, if you don't have enough money to pay for one, just ask your supplier to send you pictures throughout the process or even video chat with them so that you can see the products for yourself. For example, you may notice that your supplier is using the wrong label or maybe something else you notice is off. But doing this will allow you to bring up that mistake right now so that it can get fixed before it's too late. Additionally, you can even include this in your agreement within the purchase order. Something that we've done in the past here is added a section in that states that the shipment must pass the inspection and if it doesn't, then the supplier needs to fix the problem and then pay for a new inspection until it passes. This is another great way to hold your supplier accountable for creating high quality products. Now, once you've placed your first order, you're gonna to need to know how to ship your product into Amazon. This requires you to create a shipping plan inside your Seller Central account. So make sure you watch this next section where I'm gonna walk you through the entire process and how to avoid the common mistakes that most beginners make. To get your inventory from the supplier's warehouse all the way into Amazon's fulfillment centers, there are two main ways to ship your product. When it comes to sea shipping, this is the more typical option as it's much cheaper. So for example, an 85 kilo shipment might cost around $400 by sea, but then over $600 by air under normal conditions. However, with air shipping, your goods could arrive within a few weeks rather than a few months. Also just keep in mind that both shipping costs and transit times do increase as it gets closer to the Q4 holiday season. On our products, we personally use sea shipping because it's a lot cheaper, but if your shipment is very small and lightweight, then air shipping might make sense for you. Additionally, if you're in a rush to get your product into Amazon, this may also be the better option. Now, remember earlier when we talked about working with a freight forwarder? Well, I'd highly recommend hiring one because they're going to arrange all of your shipping for you. They'll handle your entire shipment, including customs, packaging, labeling, and so on. They're essentially a trusted partner for your business, and in a lot of ways, the process would be almost impossible for the average person without them. So, how do you go about finding a freight forwarder? Well, there are several places to look, but I'd recommend going to freightos.com. Here you can get quotes from multiple freight forwarders and see which quotes look best to you. How this works is that first, you select your origin, which in this case is gonna be either the factory or warehouse of your supplier. Then choose the country your supplier's factory or warehouse is located in, and then enter their address. The next step is to select your destination, which if you're using Amazon FBA, you'll choose the fulfillment center option. Again, enter the country and then the address of a fulfillment center. Now, a quick note here. Technically, you don't yet know the address of the fulfillment center that you're gonna be sending your products to. So I recommend just choosing one in your country 
to get you past this step so that you can begin searching for freight forwarders. Then once you choose a freight forwarder to work with, before paying, make sure to let them know that you'll be updating the final destination address once you have it, which I'll be showing you how to get in just a moment. So for now, check out this helpful website to find the addresses of Amazon fulfillment centers all across the world. Just pick one close to you and enter in that address. Now the third step here is to enter your load or what you're shipping. Here you have a couple of options regarding the container that you choose for shipping. If you have enough goods to fill the entire container, you'll ship a full container load, also known as FCL. But if you don't have enough goods to fill an entire container, you'll ship loose cargo. And this is often referred to as less than container load or LCL. In this case, your goods will be shipped with other people's goods in the container. And don't worry if you don't know this, you can simply ask your supplier and they'll let you know which one. Next, you wanna fill out the rest of this information such as package type, pallet type, and dimensions, which again, can all be provided by asking your supplier. Lastly, you wanna fill out the value of your goods here, which is often provided on the invoice that you got from your supplier. Then choose when your products are ready or if they'll be ready in a few weeks, and that's it. Once you fill out all that information, you'll be able to look and sort through all the listed freight forwarders. When selecting a freight forwarder, you wanna keep in mind the price, how well they communicate, whether or not they've worked with small sellers like you before, and most importantly, make sure they're knowledgeable on all of Amazon's requirements. Now that you have a freight forwarder, it's time to set sail and get your goods into Amazon. To do this, let me walk you through setting up a shipping plan inside of Seller Central. This is a step that you're gonna have to do on your own, even if you've hired a freight forwarder. This is also where you'll find the address of the exact FBA warehouse that you'll be sending your products to. So first, go up to inventory and then select shipments. Up at the top, click send to Amazon. You'll start by entering your ship from address. And typically this is gonna be the address of your freight forwarder. Next, select your marketplace destination from the drop down menu here. If you're only selling in the United States, you'll just have this one option here. Otherwise, if you're selling outside of the United States, make sure to select the country that you want to send your products to. Next, this is where you choose the product that you're gonna send into Amazon. First, find your product, then click the Packaging Details drop-down menu. Now decide whether you're sending individual or case-packed products. Individual means you have different SKUs or products inside of one box, whereas case-packed means you only have one product inside the box. If you select case-packed, you'll go ahead and enter a template name, the number of units per box, and the box dimensions and weight. But don't worry, all this information can be provided by asking your supplier. Lastly, click this to see if your type of product has any specific prep requirements. Make sure you carefully look through this list. And if your product falls under one of these categories, you'll then select who is doing the prep for your shipment. All Amazon cares about is whether it's Amazon or someone else. So we recommend having your supplier or freight forwarder do the prep rather than Amazon as Amazon's gonna end up charging you more. If you do choose Amazon to do the prep, you'll notice that they're also gonna be responsible for labeling your units for an additional cost per unit. Now, real quick, if you've been learning lots in this video and getting a lot of value from it, then give us a thumbs up down below just to let us know that you are liking this video. We truly appreciate it. Now, if there's no prep needed, then you can simply select if it's gonna be you or Amazon that's going to label your units. Now we're gonna jump back near the start of this process to show you what it looks like if you selected individual units. So for that, you'll need to click the pencil icon to edit the details. Again, this is where you select if your product needs any specific prep and who is going to label the units. From here, click save. Next, if you selected individual units, you'll need to tell Amazon how many units you're sending in. Enter your quantity and then click ready to pack. 
However, if you selected case packed, you'll need to tell Amazon how many boxes you're sending in. Enter your quantity and then click ready to send. Next, whether you selected individual or case packed, you're gonna need to scroll down to the bottom and click print all SKU labels. This will open a box that allows you to download a PDF file of your labels so that you can print them out. If you choose to do the prep yourself, then you're going to send this PDF file to your supplier and ask them to attach the labels to your product's packaging. Now, one note regarding this next step. If you selected case packed units, you'll simply click confirm and continue. This will skip past an additional step that you need if you selected individual units. So we're gonna come right back to this section in just a moment. Now, if you select individual units, you're gonna see the option here to click pack individual units. From here, you need to tell Amazon how many boxes you're sending in. If everything fits into one box, then select the first option. Click confirm, then type in the dimensions and weight of your box. Then click confirm packaging information, followed by confirm and continue. But if your shipment requires multiple boxes, then you're gonna want to select the second option. Click confirm, then type in the number of boxes that you're gonna be sending in. The default method here is to enter this information through a web form, which in my opinion is the easiest way to complete this step. However, you can also choose to enter this information through an Excel file or even tell Amazon to manually process your boxes, which they can do, but for an additional 15 cents per unit. So going back to the web form, enter the amount of boxes that you're gonna be sending in, then click open web form. Here is where you select how many units will be inside each box. Again, your supplier will be able to provide all this information for you. The last step here is to enter each box's weight and dimensions. Once done, click confirm packaging information. On to step number two. Now, like I mentioned in the previous step, if you selected case packed units, this will actually be the same workflow you'll see regardless if you're doing individual or case packed units. So to start, select your ship date, which is the date that you expect to hand your inventory to the carrier. This date helps Amazon prepare to receive your inventory, but don't worry too much about getting this exactly right because you can always come back in and change this date after you confirm shipping. Next, decide if you're shipping SPD or LTL. SPD means small parcel delivery. This consists of units packed into individual boxes and each box is individually labeled for delivery. Normally these are smaller shipments sent via DHL, UPS, FedEx, or other local postal services. On the other hand, LTL deliveries consist of multiple shipping boxes transported together on pallets. Typically shipments that weigh less than 150 pounds are cheaper sent by SPD, and for anything heavier than that, it's best to use LTL. Next. Amazon will now tell you what fulfillment centers you're gonna be sending your products to. Below, you're gonna see a shipping price for selecting Amazon's partner carrier, which in this case is UPS. We recommend choosing this option as Amazon offers discounted shipping rates, but if you wish, you can also select a non-Amazon partnered carrier from this drop-down menu. Just be aware that if you do choose another carrier, you'll have to pay for and arrange the shipping yourself. Now, after making your selection, go ahead and click accept charges and confirm shipping. The last step here is to print the FBA box labels. Simply click print, which is gonna open up a PDF file. You'll want to save this file and then send it to whoever is prepping your boxes, whether it's your supplier or freight forwarder ask them to correctly attach these labels to your boxes before shipping them to Amazon. Then once your supplier or freight forwarder has attached your labels, you'll come back to this page and then click mark all as shipped. And that's it. Once you complete this final step, you can then go over to the shipping queue to track the status of your shipment. Now at this point, your inventory is set to ship. 
So you have a little bit of time before it arrives. I recommend using this time wisely to set up your Amazon listing and ensure that it's fully optimized. This is how customers are going to find your product, so it's really important to do it right. Jake's gonna show you exactly how to do this in the next step, so make sure to keep watching to learn how to create your first listing. Step eight, build your Amazon listing. There are six steps to building a successful listing, and it all starts with knowing how to do keyword research. These are my top two tips for coming up with high volume keywords that you can use for not only your listing, but also in your advertising campaigns once you get there. First, using Keyword Scout, search for whatever keyword you think is most relevant for your product. So let's take our product, for example. I think most people would describe it as just like a washable pee pad for dogs. So with this keyword, I can run a search for it, and then Keyword Scout will give me a bunch of other search terms that shoppers are using to buy this type of product. You'll most likely discover new search terms here that you probably never even considered using yet. And because this list is automatically sorted by search volume, all the most popular terms are right here at the top. It's also helpful to open up a few of these keywords to check the historical search volume over the past two years. Oftentimes, you'll find interesting trends that are really good to know when it comes to forecasting the level of demand for your product. Now, if you noticed, we have a few thousand keywords here. And of course, we're probably not gonna be able to use them all. So what I'd recommend doing in this case is using filters to narrow this list down to a much more manageable number. You wanna experiment with this a little bit, but what I like to do is to set a minimum monthly search volume threshold of around 500 monthly searches. Now my list will shorten and display only the most high volume keywords that I should focus on adding to my listing. At this point, checking this box will allow you to save all these keywords to a list that you can use to help create your listing. Now for my second tip, I'm gonna show you how to reverse search your competitors to find the top keywords they're using to capture sales. So to do this, head over to Amazon and search for your top 10 competitors. Then copy all of their ASINs, which are usually found up here in the URL, and they always start with B0. Or if you have Jungle Scout, you can just find it right here, or even scroll down to the bottom of the page in the product information section, you can find it right there as well. Now go ahead and copy these 10 ASINs back into Keyword Scout and click search. This will now show you all the top keywords that these 10 products are ranking for. Make sure to add all of these keywords to your keyword list you just created, and now you'll have a more comprehensive list to use for not just your listing and advertising campaigns, but also your backend search terms. Step two, create your listing in Seller Central. To start, click on Catalog, add products. Then click, I'm adding a product not sold on Amazon. The next step is to select a category to list your product in. You can either search for your category here or scroll down and select one from the list. If you're ever unsure which category you should sell in, a really great way to find this out is by pulling up your competitors' listings and identifying what categories they're in. Here's a quick example. I pulled up three of our closest competitors and noticed they're all selling in the exact same category, pet supplies. This then breaks down into the following subcategories pet supplies, dogs, litter and housebreaking, training pads and trays, and training pads. You also see I have a few options here, but because our product is reusable, I'll select the reusable option. And now you can be in the process of creating your first listing. Now, just a quick heads up, this screen may look different depending on the category you're in, but for the most part, everything here is practically the same. You may just have a few extra or even a few less fields than we do right now. So in this tab, enter your product ID, and in most cases, this is the UPC barcode that you purchased earlier. So if you didn't watch that section, make Make sure to revisit section five where Lenny walked you through the entire process of buying your GS1 UPC barcodes. Next, enter your product and brand name. Now, don't worry too much about nailing these right now. You just need to fill it out with something so that you can move on to the next section, and then you can always come back and change it later when optimizing your listing. Also, if your product has any variations, make sure to click yes up here and then select the appropriate variations. Onto the next section, with private label, you are technically the manufacturer, so you can just enter your own brand name here. For this part number section, this is very similar to the seller SKU that you'll find in the offer tab, and for both of these, you can just make them up. However, you will see them a lot, so I'd strongly recommend recommend using something that's easy to identify what your product is. Now for the rest of these highlighted sections, these are all mandatory, so make sure you fill them out. And if you ever run into any questions, you can just hover over the question mark icon for a brief description. Or if you're really stuck, you can always leave us a comment down below and like all of our videos, we'll make sure to respond to each and every question. So at this point, you're obviously not done with your listing yet, but you are far enough to at least click save as draft. 
Step three, draft your listing's title. Now, because we created a keyword list earlier, I'd recommend doing all the keyword related things inside Jungle Scout's listing builder. This tool will help guide your SEO strategy by making it easier to incorporate your best keywords and also avoid repeating any keywords as well. How it works is in one click, Jungle Scout will sync your listings with Amazon. So that way you can easily move your data between your Seller Central account and Jungle Scout. So let's now walk through the process of drafting your title. First, select your listing and then select the keyword list that you made earlier. Now, before you start, I'd recommend cleaning up the keywords by removing all of the duplicate words. This is really useful because once a keyword has been used in your listing, Amazon doesn't reward you for repeating it. So for example, in your title, you only really have a limited number of characters to use. So you're much better off adding your most important keywords there, and then for the rest of your keywords, using them in your bullet points and product description. After that, you can now draft the title. A few tips on drafting your title. So of course, you wanna make sure you please the algorithm by using as many of those high volume search terms as you possibly can, but also it's equally important that the title just flows naturally and is legible for shoppers. So the strategy here is to take these high volume keywords and smartly weave them in while still making it highly readable. Something like this, for example. Next up, your bullet points. While your title is all about your high volume keywords, the focus of your bullet points should be to inform customers about the top features of your product and also include the rest of your medium to high volume keywords. If you're not sure what to write about, you can always check your competitors' listings for some inspiration. But pay attention to not just their bullet points, but also the Q&A section, as well as the review section. If there are any complaints on your competitors' listings that your product overcomes, then make sure to include this in your bullet points. Remember, you can always go back and edit your listing copy, so just don't stress too much right here. Step five, your listing's description. Similar to your bullet points, this is still a very important section to add keywords, even though it's not an area that most shoppers pay attention to. However, if you're a brand registered seller, you can actually replace this section with what's known as A plus content. This allows you to add additional images and text to your listing, highlighting the things that make your product and brand superior to competitors. You can find this in Seller Central under advertising and then A plus content manager. When you're designing your content, you really wanna make sure it looks good on mobile Mobile because on mobile, it actually appears above your bullet points. And Amazon actually has a few different layouts that you can use to customize your A-plus content. So you really don't need to be a designer and you can even just do something very simple like we did here. But for those who don't know, Amazon Brand Registry is a program that was ruled out a few years ago and it allows you to have greater control of your listing. If you enroll, you'll gain more functionality and have additional protection for your products. To sign up, you must have a registered trademark, which is typically the hardest part. But because trademarks have a notoriously long approval process, you can gain access to brand registry much faster by taking advantage of a program called the Amazon IP Accelerator. This is actually what I use to get my trademark and basically all you're doing is using Amazon's pre-vetted law firms to submit your trademark for you. And by far the biggest advantage is while your trademark is being approved, you'll You'll gain instant access to brand registry right when you submit the request. So you don't have to wait almost a year in some cases to begin using a content. Now, having a trademark or using this program isn't required whatsoever, but if it does fit within your budget, I'd highly recommend it. Outside of a content, some of the biggest benefits include being able to report listings that you know are violating your IP. You can also upload videos to your listings, which is super powerful and helps you get more sales. And then another great benefit is being able to create an attractive Amazon storefront. Uh, these come in handy, especially during the holiday season. But again, this isn't necessary when you first start out. And I always suggest that people just get started first and then apply for brand registry as soon as it makes sense. On to step number six which is to capture and upload your product images. Images are incredibly important for your listing, so you need to put a lot of effort into this step. You essentially have two options, either take the images yourself or you can hire a professional. Amazon even makes it easy for you to find experienced photographers. So just head over to Seller Central and hover over Partner Network and then select Explore Services. From here, select your country, where you're selling, and then from this drop-down menu, select Imaging. You'll now see a full list of partners who are experienced taking high quality product images. If you're taking the images yourself though, just make sure you open up and review Amazon's full image guidelines. This will tell you what type of images you can upload as well as the technical requirements that your files must meet. Take our images, for example. Outside of the main image, our number one goal is to explain to shoppers how this product will solve their problem. And your images play the biggest role in this since shoppers aren't able to physically experience your product before purchasing. So you want your images to clear up any confusion that they may have, as well as allow them to picture how life could be better if they just buy your product. One way of doing this is by including lifestyle images. 
These are images that show your product in use, giving the customer a way to put themselves in the model's shoes. These images should hit on their emotions, and while they are a little bit expensive and sometimes harder to get, trust me, they're definitely worth the extra money. Additional elements you can include on your listing are infographics. This is design work on your photos that highlights the main benefits of your product. You can create a competitive matrix, show the dimensions of your product, add arrows that highlight the main benefits, or any other design that helps highlight what sets your product apart from the competition. Just keep in mind that many customers will be browsing on mobile devices, so keep your designs simple and clear. And it's good to know that while you can upload a maximum of nine images, only the first seven will appear in the main image block on your listing. If you upload more than seven images, customers will have to click on one of the images to reveal the rest. As mentioned earlier, another great benefit of brand registry is that it gives you the ability to add videos to your listing. However, now, if you want your video to appear in the main image block, you can only upload a maximum of six images. But just like before, if you do upload more than six images and have a video, customers can still view it. They'll just have to click on one of the images to reveal the video. Just something to keep in mind. Now, I hope you're still enjoying this video so far. If so, let us know by hitting the like button down below. So now once your listing is built and also fully optimized, the next step is to prepare for takeoff and officially launch your product. When your inventory arrives, you wanna have a go-to-market strategy that helps you get your first initial sales and reviews. So that's the topic of this next section, so keep watching to learn the best strategies for launching your product. Step nine, launch your product on Amazon. In our first year selling this product, it got over 500 reviews and $200,000 in sales. But honestly, our strategy was actually pretty simple. We came in with a strong pricing strategy, we promoted our product with coupons, and we ran a lot of Amazon advertising campaigns. But it's how we executed these three steps that made this product launch successful. So we're gonna dive deeper into these three strategies, but first, it's important to understand that on Amazon, reviews are king. Without reviews, it's hard to convince shoppers to buy from you. But when you're just starting out with zero reviews, how do you even get your first sales? Here's the formula that we used. And just know that this whole formula is meant to be very simple because no matter how you slice it, there are only two main ways to get reviews. You first need to drive more traffic to your product. Why? Because when your traffic increases, you'll typically get more sales. And when you get more sales, you now have more customers able to give you a review. But getting more sales is only half the battle. You see, the second way to get more reviews is to increase your product's review rate. In other words, after someone buys your product, how can you increase the likelihood of them actually leaving a review? By focusing on these two objectives, this is exactly how we went from zero to 500 reviews in just our first year. So going back to our three-step process here, here's what you can do to get your first reviews. It all starts with your pricing strategy. It's no secret that on Amazon, price plays a huge role in why shoppers buy. That's why it's super important to make sure your price is very competitive. But that doesn't just mean lower your price below your competitors. You wanna be really smart about this, so make sure to calculate your break-even price. In other words, what's the lowest price you can afford to sell your product for and still remain profitable? To do this, open up the Jungle Scout extension and click on the net column. From here, enter in your total landed cost, which includes manufacturing, shipping, and anything else per unit. Then adjust the selling price until you find either your break-even number or a number that allows you to make just a very small profit. Whatever your target price is, keep in mind that it's actually okay to price a little bit lower during this launch period. And it's actually ideal because in your first few weeks or even months, you don't wanna be too worried about making a huge profit. Instead, your focus should be more on improving your keyword rankings and getting more reviews. Then once you hit your goal, maybe it's like 100 reviews or so, you can then increase your price to begin maximizing the profit. Now the next way to get more sales is to promote your product through the use of coupons. So in combination with lowering your price, try offering a small discount inside of Amazon. You can find this option inside of Seller Central under coupons. The main advantage of coupons is that shoppers can actually discover your products by browsing either the coupons homepage or by directly viewing them within search results. This is great because when you have a coupon active, you can show off this bright green badge that is very hard to miss. It just makes your product really pop out compared to products that don't have one. This is why when you combine coupons with your pricing strategy, it's the perfect recipe for getting more traffic and hopefully more sales. However, the question many sellers wonder at this stage 
Is it just better to lower your price or, or keep a higher price and then offer a coupon? I'll say that we've seen some pretty different results on this, but what I think worked really well for us was offering a small 5% discount and then going back to our price and increasing it by 5%. That way we aren't dipping below our break even price to take advantage of the benefits coupons offer. Also, hey, if you're getting any value from this video so far, let us know by hitting the like button down below. Okay, now just because you have a low price and you're using coupons, that doesn't mean shoppers are actually able to see your product. This is where advertising comes into play. By bidding on high volume keywords, running ads on Amazon will help get your competitively priced product right in front of potential customers. And this is crucial, especially if your competitors have hundreds or even thousands of reviews. Advertising helps you cut the line and push your product right ahead of theirs. When you combine showing up at the top of the page and having a competitive price, the chances of shoppers clicking your product over theirs increases dramatically. Amazon makes these ads super easy to set up. You can even run an automatic campaign that does most of the heavy lifting for you. With this campaign, you're allowing Amazon to decide which keywords to display your ad for. They choose these keywords based on your listing's title, bullet points, description, and even your backend keywords, uh, which is why it's really important to make sure you've already done your keyword research and you have an optimized listing. Now, on the other hand, you can also launch manual campaigns, which take a little bit more work to set up, but you have much more control since you select the keywords to target and not Amazon. For this, you wanna use that same keyword list you made earlier with Keyword Scout. These are the three main ways to drive more traffic to your listing, and the real magic happens when you take them all and combine them together. But just remember, driving more traffic and getting more sales doesn't always mean those customers are going to leave you a review. On Amazon, the average review rate is between one and 2%, meaning out of every 100 sales you get, only about one or two of those customers actually write a review. Going back to the two main ways to get reviews, I'm now gonna share with you three strategies to increase your product's review rate. So the best way to get more reviews is to simply just ask your customers to leave a review. And I'm being serious, but believe it or not, a ton of sellers actually aren't even aware that you can do this inside your Seller Central account. So on the orders page here, you can ask Amazon to send your customers a review request email for any purchase within the last 30 days. And while customers often opt out of receiving emails from Amazon, this is one that they don't typically opt out of. However, as I'm sure you can see, clicking through it the way Amazon designed can be incredibly time consuming. That's why we created an easy way for you to automate this entire process by sending out review request emails every 24 hours without any effort on your end. Let me show you how this works. To access this feature, click on marketing and then review automation. And as long as your account is synced to Seller Central, this process is extremely easy. All you have to do is toggle this switch to the on position and really the rest is history. Just set it and forget it because now Jungle Scout will automatically send out review request emails to each of your eligible orders every 24 hours. By default, these emails will go out five days after your customer receives the product. This is the earliest Amazon allows, but sometimes you're actually more likely to get a review if it was just sent a little bit later. So for example, let's say you're selling vitamins, right? You wouldn't wanna request a review before the customer even has a chance to appreciate the benefits. That's why in some cases, a delayed request could actually increase the likelihood of your product earning a review. To create a delay, you can just come over here and adjust the time frame by up to 30 days. And you can also do this on the product level or even just delay certain orders only. And sometimes we do get asked this question. So yes, this tool is 100% Amazon Terms of Service approved. You don't have to worry about breaking any rules since you're just automating Amazon's own request process. Okay, now another great way to get more reviews is by enrolling your product in Amazon's Vine program. Essentially, this program allows you to give out your products to pre-vetted Vine reviewers. These are people who Amazon think leave really great reviews. And how it works is they request your product and once they receive it, you'll get an honest and detailed review. Now, of course, this doesn't guarantee you'll only receive positive feedback. So just make sure you're confident in the quality of your product before enrolling. Also, keep in mind that Amazon does charge $200 for each newly enrolled ASIN, but it's just a one-time cost and sometimes Amazon actually offers special sign-up bonuses to help reimburse you for this charge. The third way to get more reviews is by using product inserts inside your packaging. Typically, these look like business cards and they're mostly used to convey important information, thank the customer for their purchase and request honest feedback. Now the keyword there is honest. Amazon has very strict rules against incentivizing only positive reviews. This means you can't offer things like gift cards, warranties, discounts, or really any other type of benefit in exchange for a positive review or actually any review for that matter. But with that said, it's still okay to ask for feedback. 
just as long as your messaging is neutral and that your customers know every experience, good or bad, warrants a review. Okay, Jake, now I do have a pretty bold confession here. Believe it or not, we've actually yet to use product inserts for our product. And we're now up to 800 reviews in just the first year and a half of selling. So that means that the only two ways that we got all of our reviews was through review automation and the Vine program. Uh, except the funny part about that is we only requested five reviews from the Vine program. So in reality, 99% of them came from automating the request emails. I really wish you could have been there and seen every little thing that we did to launch this product. Well, in fact, you actually can. Over the past year, we've documented our entire process that you can watch for free right here on YouTube. It's called the Million Dollar Case Study. It's essentially a blueprint where we peel back the curtains and show you what it takes to sell on Amazon. So come be a fly on the wall and take a sneak peek into the journey of how we found, made, and launched our latest product.